Okay, so we're going to get started for the next last workshop. This is a very cool workshop. I encourage students to come forward and sit so we can have more engaging and interactive workshop session. And uh, I'm so grateful for Andrew Ginter. Andrew Ginter leads a team of experts who work with the world's most secure industrial enterprise. Before Waterfall, he led the development of a high-end industrial control system products at Hewlett Packard of IT and OT middleware products at Agilent Technologies. And of course, world's first industrial SAM, SIEM at Industrial Defender. Andrew is the author of three books. One of the things that I really enjoyed when I was went to a conference in Minneapolis, I, I saw a book by OT. I was so impressed with this book and I need to find this Andrew. So I was able to find that book and I invited Andrew to request him to see if he can able to speak and do a workshop for us. So thank you, Andrew, for being here and agreed to do this workshop. So um, he's also co-author of UITP report on cybersecurity requirements in rail system tendering. He co-hosts the industrial security podcast and contributes regularly to industrial security standards and best practice guidance. It is my extreme honor to invite Andrew Ginter to the stage and the floor is yours, Andrew. And he's going to make it, this is a very engaging session. So I would encourage students to participate. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm, I've got a few slides here. I've, I've got about, I don't know, half an hour uh, of material I'm going to go through. But then, yes, uh, you know, as said, I uh, I would welcome people to, to come forward. And, and uh, you know, I understood there's a lot of students here. I uh, was going to ask them to help me uh, figure out how to break into industrial control systems. But let's give you some background first on on what are these things and, and how do they work? And, you know, what is the, the latest in terms of protecting them, which is uh, a term that, that I use called engineering grade. It's known by other names, security engineering. It's known by cyber informed engineering. And I'll, I'll be going through all that. Um, a word about Waterfall. I work for Waterfall. We produce unidirectional gateways. We invented the technology. I'm talking about that in about half an hour for five minutes. Um, we work the world's most secure industrial sites. Um, the majority of North America's nuclear generators are our customers. Um, the largest rail switching systems, the largest water tree plants, think heavy industry primarily, though increasingly we see data centers uh, you know, working with us as well. Um, why? Because data centers have become the world's critical information infrastructure. Um, but let me say a few words first about uh, industrial control systems. Let's talk about industrial processes. Um, this is a picture of a refinery that I had the privilege of visiting about 10 years ago. Um, this is a small refinery. Um, when I say small, uh, you know, A, it's, it's small by the standard of refineries. The white specks in the foreground are automobiles. Okay, this is seven and 10 stories of piping. Um, and... When we went into this facility, I was going with someone who'd been there many times. It just wrong. And I could not put my finger on it. They, they, you know, we, we drove up four of us in the car. We had to get out, bring our passports out, go into the security shed, you know, make sure that we were the right people that had been in, you know, invited to, to, to get a tour of the site. And that all made sense. And then what got weird was they did not let us get back into the vehicle. The driver got back into the vehicle. He was allowed to drive the vehicle through the checkpoint, badging through the checkpoint. And then we had to badge through a separate pedestrian entrance. And then we could get back into the vehicle. And nobody opened the trunk. Nobody, you know, there, there could have been, who knows what, hiding in the trunk of the vehicle. It it just felt wrong. So I asked, you know, the my, my colleague who'd been there many times, I said, what's going on here? That just That was just weird. And he says, Andrew, Andrew, he says, you need to understand at this facility, the physical security system is part of the safety program. He said, um, all of those questions they asked us about exactly where we were going to be and when we were going to be there and who we were going to be with, all of those questions that they asked us in the, in the security shed are because if there is an incident at the refinery, they will risk the lives of rescue personnel going into a dangerous area if they know there is someone there to rescue. And so it is vitally important that when you go anywhere in this facility and you see one of those badge things, 
badge into it so they know where you are. You had to walk through that the, the pedestrian entrance so that they made sure you badged in and you didn't get missed. If there's somebody hiding in the trunk, they said, they're on their own. This is the thing. At all of the large industrial sites I've ever had the privilege of visiting, the first priority for everyone at the site, it doesn't matter if it's cybersecurity, engineering, the first priority at every one of these sites is safety. Don't kill anyone. Don't cause an environmental disaster. The second priority is generally reliability. There are exceptions. Uh, if it's critical infrastructure, keep the critical infrastructure running. If it's, um, you know, this refinery is probably a $2 billion investment. Keep the investment producing finished goods. And the third priority, and this is often the priority that that uh, everyone thinks out all day long, is efficiency. Because all of these large facilities inevitably, inevitably produce commodities. And economic theory dictates that in a, in a free market, and the international market is generally a free market. You know, OPEC tries to control the price of oil, but these are, are rare exceptions. Um, in a free market, the cost of a commodity over time approaches the cost of production. And so uh, profit margins at these very large, very expensive facilities tend to be razor thin. Um, so safety first, reliability second, efficiency next. What do these things look like on the inside? Um, this is a model that you'll, you'll hear talked about. It's called the Purdue model for networks within industrial facilities generally. Um, sometimes it's also called this, the IEC 62443 model. Six, IEC is the International Electrotechnical Commission. 62443 is their family of cybersecurity standards for industrial sites. It is the most detailed and the most widely used industrial cybersecurity standard on the planet. If you have anything to do with OT security, you'll hear 62443 for the rest of your career. Um, and this is the model they use. They got uh, five or six levels of stuff. Level zero is not computerized at all. Level zero is the fickle process. It's the pipes, it's the valves, it's the pumps. Um, level one is the computers that are directly connected to the physical process. These are have many names. Naming in this industry is horrible. It's an old industry. And so there's a lot of history to a lot of these names. But these computers are called anything from programmable logic controllers to remote terminal units to protective relays to safety instrumented systems. What's unique about them is that they tend to have physical electrical connections to the sensors that are part of the physical process. This is the lowest layer that controls and monitors the physical world. There may be a wide area network involved if we're talking a power grid there's a wide area network to connect the central control system to substations, power substations or pumping stations, pipelines. In a refinery, um, there's no wide area network. It's all inside the fence. It's all a bunch of local area networks connected together. So the, the, the WAN is optional. Level two is generally where you see what's called the human machine interface. This is a set of screens. What you see there is the human machine interface for Detroit water. Um, one operator sits at that physical workstation, works with all that information, supervising the operation of a water treatment system that produces drinking waters for two and a half million people, and that treats wastewater for seven million people. Detroit Water treats wastewater for a lot of the surrounding communities. You tend to see somewhere between in a, in a system like this, typically, you know, one operator handles between fifty thousand and one hundred and fifty thousand data points. Uh, tends to wander around between a few thousand screen definitions. Almost all of these screens are summaries. There's no way you can render 150,000 data points in a way that operators can make sense of. So you, these are summaries. If you see a blinking red light, you click on the red light and a, a detail screen comes up, which is also a summary with one or two blinking red lights. You click on that, you go down maybe two or three levels before you get to a screen that's dealing with the actual sensor and the operator can look at it and look at the context and decide is this a problem that needs to be fixed or is this um you know a, a sensor that's malfunctioning and giving me contradictory readings to everything else nearby this is what operators do they operate this human machine interface higher up is what's called the plant wide systems in a power plant you would have one of those operator workstations for every generating unit you might have between two and six generating units in large power plants 
between two and six full-time operators. In a large refinery, you'll have as many as 25 or 30 full-time operator stations. Um, higher up, you've got the business network. And you know at the very top is, of course, the internet. And a lot of people nowadays put a level six on there, which is the cloud. And of course, the internet is uh, in this model source of all evil. Um, so with that <laughs> very high level introduction to what is an industrial control system, um, let's look at the threat environment. Um, this is from uh, Wall Falls 2023 report. Um, the threat report is arguably the most cautious on the planet. Um, there's a lot of threat reports out there that talk about attacks. They talk about near misses. They talk about stolen information. This threat report looks at deliberate attacks, okay, not equipment failures, not errors and emissions, deliberate attacks that caused production outages or damaged equipment or other physical consequences, deliberate attacks causing physical consequences in the industries that we track, which is manufacturing and heavy industry. Uh, healthcare is important, but we don't track that bluntly because we don't understand it. Um, so deliberate attacks, heavy industry, um, physical consequences, in the public record. Every cyber attack we count here is listed in the appendix with a link where you can go to the front page of the New York Times and verify the existence of the attack and, and see if you, you know, believe the information yourself. There's a lot of, you know, I, I talked about awareness being a problem. A lot of people are in denial that there is a cybersecurity problem in the industrial space. Um, so with those criteria, pop quiz for you, I know some of you know the answer. Um, how many attacks were there in 2010 that met that criteria in the year 2010? All your there was shout it out one. It was Stuxnet, credited with destroying over a thousand uh, uranium gas centrifuges in uh, Iran's uh, nuclear system, nuclear nuclear program. Um, in 2011, there was zero. Lots of attacks, especially on the North American electric grid, all of which were stealing information. People were saying this was reconnaissance for a future uh, attack causing sabotage. Um, or attacks that tried to commit sabotage and were defeated before there were physical consequences. There were two in 2012, there was zero in 2013, there was one in 2014, a German steel mill. Mill was never identified, but it was a credible report from the German authorities. Uh, 2015 was the first Russian attack on the Ukrainian power grid. 2016 was the second Russian attack on the Ukrainian power grid. 2017 was a busy year. Triton was an attack on safety systems, arguably attempted murder. Didn't, did not manage to kill anybody, but did manage to shut down a large industrial site in the Middle East twice. Uh, not Petya was huge. If one act, we counted it as one attack because one piece of malware was dropped in one place and then it auto-updated to hundreds of victims. Mersk shipping shut down, the world's largest container ship, shipping shut down for six days. Merck Pharmaceutical had to shut four plants down and scrub the batches in progress in those plants. Cost them $1.4 billion. U.S. dollars, 10 to the ninth dollars, massive costs. Oh, here we go. 2018, there was one, a semiconductor fab in Taiwan. 2019 was again five. The, the headline you might have heard of was Norsk Hydro. 2020 was a busy year. There was 18 attacks. Uh, the headline, uh, pardon me, there wasn't a headline, 18 attacks, all of them were ransomware. The next year, there was 23 attacks. Colonial was the headline. Um, all except one were ransomware. And last year, brain blank, there we go. Last year, there was even more. Some of them shut down critical infrastructure in the form of uh, oil terminals. Uh, oil tankers could not fill or unloaded. Um, some of them are brand names. Bristone was down. Um, Agco went down. Who's Agco? Is that a brand name? They produce Massey Ferguson for, uh, furniture, Massey Ferguson farm equipment. Uh, for two weeks in the middle of planting season in North America, they couldn't produce spare parts. Agricultural. There's more. Um, Profete, small company, went out of business because they were shut down by ransomware. Uh, 
EPM is uh, in the, the nation of Columbia, um, again, uh, critically structure impaired. And here we go. Um, Copper Mountain mining, a large strip mine in Northern Canada. 57 of these incidents. The world has changed. In the years, in the decade, 2010 through 2019, cyber attacks with physical consequences were largely a theoretical problem. This decade, now we only have four data points, but they seem to point in a very clear direction. Does anyone in the room believe that we will ever go back to a year like 2018 where there was one attack in the world, in the public record, in these industries with physical consequences? I don't. Did you say? Yes, sir. There will be if we fix the problem. Eventually, <laughs> sometime down the road. Very good. That's fair. This thus speaks the optimism of youth. You see, I'm I'm nearing I'm nearing retirement. <laughs> I have the opposite opinion. Um, and something I wanted to say earlier in terms of the optimism of youth, um, you know, you young folk who are are uh, looking at careers in the space, um, think about. So this is sort of local trend. The last decade. Think about mega trends. Ever since about the early 1950s, we have been automating industrial operations of one kind or another with computers. It got started big time in the you know early to mid 1960s, but we've been doing this for what 40 years now. For 40 years we have been deploying more and more computers to control our physical operations. Every one of those computers is a target for cyber attacks. We've been deploying more and more targets for going on 50 years. Um, and data in motion is the lifeblood of modern automation. And so for 50 years, we have been connecting these computers more and more intensely to each other and to the internet. Here's the thing, every connection that lets data move also lets cyber attacks move. For 40 or 50 years, we have been deploying more and more targets and we've been creating more and more opportunities to attack those targets. It should be no surprise that the cybersecurity problem that we face is getting worse. Are any of these mega trends going to reverse in the next 30 years? We're going to continue deploying more computers, more targets. We're going to continue connecting up all of the computers we have. This problem is going to get much worse before it gets any better. The nature of job I'm doing today, the job did not exist when I came out of school. So the nature of the job is going to change, but the problem, I suggest, is going to get much worse before it gets better. Yes, there's local in the you know local economies go up and down, and sometimes there are jobs and sometimes there's not. But career-wise, this is an opportunity that's not going to go away. Um, project the numbers. We're projecting. We're we're counting the data now. It's not the end of the year yet, but we're counting. We're projecting somewhere between 100 and 150 cyber attacks, impacting somewhere between 200 and 200 industrial sites this year. This is the trend. I, I talked about nation states. You know, a lot of the, not all, of, but you know, a significant number, a measurable fraction of ransomware threat actors out there have nation state attack capabilities. Why is that important? Um, especially for, for you folks new to the space. Uh, it's a truism of cybersecurity that nothing is secure. Uh, cybersecurity is a spectrum. It can always be more secure. You can always be less secure. The question, am I secure, is meaningless. It's like the question, am I safe? Are we safe right now? Yeah, sort of. Could we be safer? Yeah, those windows could be bulletproof. Could we be less safe? Yeah, those windows could be gone, okay? It's a spectrum. And so it's a truism that given enough time and money and talent, any cybersecurity posture can be breached. Who has essentially unlimited time and money and talent? It's nation states. It's a very bad thing that nation state grade threats are coming against industrial infrastructures, even if the volume today is comparatively low. Uh, it's, by the way, uh, increased 10x every two and a half years. This is a crisis coming at us down the tracks. I do not believe that we can build a cybersecurity wall big enough and strong enough and fast enough to stop that train. I believe what we need to do 
is to get off the tracks. And the good news is that there is a way to do that. This is what I was talking about earlier, cyber-informed engineering. Um, this is a way to get off the tracks. Um, this is a report. The first, the top report, uh, the strategy came out, what is it now? A little bit less than 18 months ago. Uh, Department of Energy funded Idaho National Labs um, in the United States to, to print this strategy. And, you know, what is it? Cybersecurity, uh, cyber-informed engineering, uh, as I mentioned, is a coin with two sides. One side, teach the engineers cybersecurity, cyber risk. The other side is use powerful engineering tools to address cyber risk. How do we do that? Classic example, the textbook example is mechanical overpressure relief valve. If I am a technician, if every one of us is a technician in a large coal-fired power plant, old school, uh, what's the plant like that look like? It looks like six generator units. Each of them has a massive five-story boiler, uh, you know, taller than this room, uh, produces steam, steam drives the turbine, turbine drives the generator, generator produces a half gigawatt of power. If we've got six of these units, we've got three gigawatts of power coming out. We, every one of us, is the technician whose job it is to keep these units working optimally. We, you know, when instrument, th these units are heavily instrumented, when the instrumentation wears out and needs replacing, it's our job to replace it. When the instrumentation goes out of calibration, it's our job to calibrate it. Um, you know, we've got the gamma ray testers to test for the, the uh, uh, corrosion through the metal while the unit is working. These are our babe. We work, every one of us works all day long within the kill zone of a worst case boiler explosion. If the boiler explodes, we never see our kids again. How would we like to be protected against a cyber attack that overheats the furnace under one of our boilers? Would we prefer a mechanical valve where there's a hole in the boiler and the steam is, you know, pushing out that hole? There's a steel plate jammed against the hole. And if the steam pressure is too high, it forces that plate against a spring or sometimes just a pin, break the pin. With the pin broken, the piece of metal is flapping, the steam escapes, and there's no explosion. Would we prefer a mechanical valve or three, because these things are mechanical, they do wear out, or would we like a longer password on the computer controlling the furnace? Most people answer the question, I'd prefer the mechanical valve, please, because it's unhackable. There's no CPU in the valve. It does what it does, predictably, deterministically. The correct answer is, Andrew, you have asked me the wrong question. This is not an either or. It's my life on the line. I want the mechanical valves. I want longer password. And I want a boatload of cybersecurity besides. Thank you. And that is the right question. That is the right answer. Um, cyber, you know, the Cyber Informed Engineering Initiative is not saying use engineering instead of cybersecurity. It's saying these are two sides of the same coin. We've neglected one side of the coin over the other and we're seeking to remedy that with the new initiative um, but we use the whole coin the sites that i see using engineering grade protection the most intensely are the same sites that use cybersecurity the most intensely it's not either or um another couple of examples um you know Engineering grade protections, you know, I use the term engineering grade. I argue that that the mechanical valve is engineering grade because the protection is is deterministic. It is predictable. You can mathematically predict the failure rate, the average failure rate for the devices. Um, contrast. What's the opposite of engineering grade? IT grade is the is the opposite. And again, the sites I see use both intensely. Don't get me wrong. I'm not criticizing IT grade, but for the record. Engineering grade is different. I mean, it, we've all, I hope, heard of the, the Tacoma Narrows disaster. It was one of the world's first suspension bridges back in, what was it, 1940? Um, back then, the, the, the civil engineers designing the bridge didn't really understand harmonic frequencies. A stiff breeze came up and started the bridge oscillating in one of its harmonic frequencies, and it eventually tore itself to pieces. Imagine, imagine that... Um, 
the engineering profession has figured out how to build suspension bridges with, I don't know, carbon composite fiber or something. They've figured out a way to build suspension bridges at one third cost of today's suspension bridges. Massive savings, huge benefit to society. The problem with the design is that it's riddled with harmonic frequencies, absolutely riddled. Just walking across the wretched bridge, enough people walking across the bridge is going to start oscillating to the point where it tears itself apart, which is fine because the engineering profession has built into the design of these bridges, has built active dampers for the vibrations, hydraulic dampers, multiply redundant power supplies, artificial intelligence controlling these dampers. Driving across this bridge feels absolutely rock solid because of these active dampers. How happy would each of us be driving across that bridge every day if we knew that the design engineer for the bridge hoped that if a cyber attack targeted the AI controlling the dampers, hoped that we could detect the attack in time to prevent disaster. How happy would we be driving across that bridge if we knew that the design engineer hoped that if we detected the attack in time, we would be able to scramble incident response teams fast enough to defeat the attack before the bridge tore itself to pieces? How happy would we be knowing that the design engineer hoped that if the incident response team failed and the AI was compromised, that they could restore the functionality of AI fast enough to prevent disaster? Hope is not what we expect of the engineering profession. When engineers design a bridge, we expect that bridge to carry a specified load in a specified operating environment for a specified number of decades. That's what we expect. Don't get me wrong. We need detect, respond, and recover. People misinterpret me. I, I, I'm not saying don't do that. We need that. But we also need engineering-grade design when public safety is at risk, when national security is at risk. And that's the side of the coin that's been neglected. That's the side of the coin that I see the great benefit in cyber-informed engineering emphasizing. Um, and, yeah, I'm going to have to skip some of this. But really quickly, um, engineers don't just wave their hand and say, risk, risk, risk. Engineers have mathematical models for risk. And... The model that people generally cite for cyber risk is not a good model for engineering grade calculations. Um, why is it? The, the, the classic model is that cyber risk has to do with consequence and likelihood. Um, you know, a, a, a really high risk is one that has an unacceptable consequence and has a material likelihood of, of being realized. Here's the problem. Um, likelihood is probability. I mean, that this model actually works for, let's say, virus infections on our IT network. We, you know, we have a large IT network, 150,000 employees, and there were 73 virus infections, and uh, you know, each of them cost $107,000 on average to clean out. This is a fine model for that. It's not even likelihood; it's frequency at that point for low impact, high frequency threats. This is a fine model. When we're talking high impact low frequency threats, it's a different animal. How many times has the entire North American power grid been knocked out by a cyber attack? It's never happened, never happened. Um, so does that mean it will never happen? Well, no, first law of cybersecurity, nothing is secure given our time, money and talent, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so what likelihood, what probability should we assign to that potential outcome? unacceptable outcome any number that we make up you know if we go to go to the the board of directors of a power utility and say you know we have a 0.03 percent chance of blah 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 they're going to go where did you get that 0.03 percent you made that up didn't you okay boards of directors are business people are really good at seeing through made up numbers and so we generally qualify we say it's a qualitative metric it's one extremely infrequent but we don't put a number on it because we know we're going to be shot down. Well, here's the problem. When you put likelihood or, you know, a, a, as a, a metric there, probability, um, you're assuming that cyber attacks are random. They're not. Imagine that we are a small shoe factory. Ransomware takes us down. We're down for 10 days. We come back up. And imagine, however unlikely it seems, imagine we've learned absolutely nothing. 
we've said, well, that was unfortunate. And we do continue doing business exactly the same as we did before. A month later, the same ransomware group comes after us. What's going to be the almost certain outcome? It's almost certain that because we went down the first time, we're going to go down exactly the same way the second time. Cyber attacks are more deterministic than probabilistic. In safety engineering terms, the overpressure valves, there's a whole discipline called safety engineering. You know, the engineers in the room know this better than I do. In safety engineering terms, um, cyber attacks are not random failures, random equipment failures. Cyber attacks are safety system design flaws. If the same set of circumstances arises a second time, exactly the same output will come about a second time. And so a better model is that risk is a function, not a product. It's a function of consequence, intent, opportunity, and capability. What does that mean? Um, consequence is the same. It's the undesirable outcome. Intent is, does our enemy want to come after us? Um, capability is, what is our enemy capable of? And opportunity is, um, what capability is needed to take over to to exploit the the opportunity attack opportunities left in our, our defensive posture and there's always attack opportunities left and so uh, a better model is one that says look if there's intent and the enemy's capability is greater than the capability needed to exploit our opportunities then we will suffer the consequence and so the right way to think about cybersecurity is a concept out of physical security called design basis threat that basically asks how high do I set the bar? Um, you know, if I'm designing an embassy in, I don't know, Indonesia, where there's active terrorist groups or Colombia, um, there will generally be, and I've never seen one of these, I don't have a security clearance, but I'm told there will generally be a design basis threat document that's classified that says the most capable attack that defensive posture is required to defeat reliably. It might say you're required to defeat a terrorist group of no more than six people armed with submachine guns and, and hand grenades trained for three months in this facility in Iran. That's what you're required to defeat reliably. You're not required to defeat a squadron of tanks driving down the street, blowing holes in buildings. And so with cyber attacks, I encourage people to draw a line and describe the most capable attack that the site is designed to defeat reliably. This is a better model than probability. Um, I'm going to have to skip some stuff, but it's all in the book if you want to read it. <laughs> um, insurance, I'm going to skip. Just let me, the, the punchline here is because of the NotPetya attack, because of other learning since NotPetya, many insurers, especially the Lloyd Syndicate, are no longer allowed to issue unlimited cyber policies to their stakeholders, to their, their policyholders. Lloyd's will no longer cover cyber attacks in any amount more than about 200 million pounds. That's their limit, their legally um, regulated limit. On that, the risk is too high. Um, here we go. Um, security engineering, back to cyber informed engineering. Um, the bad news is that uh, the initiative is only 18 months old and the strategy that came out is a roadmap. It's not a recipe. Uh, the good news is that a lot of the contents of the, the emerging body of knowledge exists already. Safety engineering has been around for 50 years. So is protection engineering. So is you know, many elements of network engineering. And so uh, you know, these are elements of the body of knowledge that, that have been around for a long time. Um, Security PHA Review is a book as well, came out in 2019. I recommend it very much. Before I read the book, I had no idea how to do this stuff. When I closed the book, I said, wow, it's obvious that this is the right way to do this. It's a brilliantly written book. In hindsight, everything it says is obvious. And it talks about things like overpressure valves, you know, mechanical valves, mechanical overspeed governors as a failsafe behind all of the cyber protections that we put in place. Um, security engineering, Coty, is my previous book. Um, the essence of the 
This book is reproduced in Appendix B in the new book, so there's no need for you to go out and buy the previous book, the black book um, that you heard mentioned earlier. Um, but it's talking about a different perspective on cyber risk for physical operations. And I think I mentioned this earlier. The perspective is instead of trying to protect the information, quick encrypt everything, we recognize that attacks arrive in information flows. Cyber sabotage attacks, all cyber sabotage is information. The only way that a control system change from a normal state to a compromised state if attack information enters the system somehow. Every information flow is potentially an attack vector. And so what we talk about you know, in, in the book, and I don't make this stuff up. I document what I see the world's most secure sites doing. Okay. Um, the most I might do, most I remember doing in writing these books is inventing terminology because everyone calls what they do something different. Everyone seems to be converging on the same destination from a different direction. And so I do invent some terminology. But, um, you know, what the, what the site points out or what the book points out is, look, if you do a comprehensive inventory of every way that information can enter your system, that's also a comprehensive inventory of attack vectors. The good news is it tends to be small. It tends to be less than two dozen attack vectors. Now what we do is physically control those attack vectors as much as we can. And I've got about five more minutes, and then I'm going to change gears. So let's see what I can cover here. I'm going to skip this one, but I wanted to point out that uh, a concrete example of network engineering is uh, the EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute uh, methodology for the industrial internet. Um, again, it's in uh, in chapter five. Um, why is network engineering important? Well, let's think about it. Um, when that overpressure valve engages, the steam escapes, there's no explosion. What happens? Well, a negative happens. There's no explosion. We live to see another day. This is a good thing. But when that happens, we shut the power plant down. Because that unsafe condition is never supposed to happen. We shut the plant down until we understood, understand what caused it, and we have taken measures to make sure it never happens again. The last, last, last ditch safety just engaged. Here's the problem. That power plant is critical to national security. It's critical infrastructure. That's what the word critical means in critical infrastructure. It's critical to the nation. And we've just turned it off. That's unacceptable. You know, when reliability impacts are unacceptable, as they tend to be in critical infrastructures, we need to be able to reliably prevent the propagation of attacks into those networks in the first place, in addition to detect, respond, and recover. Uh, and this is what network engineering does. And uh, the most, so, and, and what I point out in the book is that Again, I invented the term network engineering. If you Google it, you won't find anything useful. But um, I invented the term to talk about a set of techniques that have been used for a long time to reliably, deterministically uh, control the propagation of attacks from one, one part of, of a network to another and to manage that interface, to make it as difficult as possible for an attack on one side of the network to have any impact the other side of the network. Um, where do we apply network engineering? We do not apply it universally. I see it applied. Again, I document what I see the world's most secure sites doing. I see it applied at criticality boundaries, at the boundary between a network whose worst case consequence of compromise is an unacceptable physical consequence and a business network. So think for an, uh, an example. Does this mean that every OD system needs network engineering? No. Uh, think a small shoe factory. Um, what's the worst that can happen? Well, the machines, let's say there's 30 machines in the factory. There's, there's uh, you know, 20 employees. The machines have yellow tape on the floor. You can walk up to the edge of the tape and be perfectly safe because that's as far as the machine can reach. It can't touch you outside the yellow tape. Um, if you see a robot go crazy while you're sipping coffee, what do you do? You say, excuse me, someone should turn this off before it hurts itself. Okay, there is no risk outside the yellow line. You've got engineering great mitigations. The risk comes when I have to crawl into the robot to fix it. And so what do I do when I'm the technician? One of the 20 employees has to crawl into the robot. I go to the robot's power switch. I go bang, 
There's more power. I've physically disconnected the power. I take a lock out of my pocket. I lock that switch in place. I put the key in my pocket. And now I crawl into the machine. The worst case outcome. What's the worst case outcome if ransomware gets in there? The machines are designed so they can't hurt themselves. There's no safety threat. It's a business threat. We're down for 10 days. We have to lay our people off. We have to pay someone through the nose to come in and clean up this mess on an emergency basis. We have to bring our people back and pay them for overtime shifts, time and a half, to make up lost production. On the end of the quarter, it cost us $15 million. We can buy insurance for that. That's an acceptable business loss. What's the worst case on a high-speed passenger rail switching system if it's compromised? The worst case is trains collide. We have a mass casualty event. We cannot buy that much insurance. So when we have a criticality boundary, high-speed rail, not on the small shoe factory. There's no criticality boundary in the small shoe factory. There's The only need for network engineering on the small shoe factory might be to... Uh, to uh, if, if the cost involved is so high, let's say it's not a small shoe factory, let's say it's Toyota. And if we lose production on four factories, we've lost 10,000 vehicles. Um, the average Toyota costs what? $35,000, $40,000? That is $400,000, sorry, $400 million in lost production. We might say, even though the business could absorb that, it's not reasonable to absorb that kind of cost, just cost benefit. We're going to use some network engineering to protect that system, not because we have to, but because it makes business sense. So this is where network engineering is, is used. It's used at criticality boundaries, and it's used when ROI calculations say, look, you'd be an idiot not to use it. The most, and I promised you this, the most widely used kind of network engineering is unidirectional gateways. This is the class of technology waterfall invented. What is a unidirectional gateway? It is not a firewall, even though it's put between two networks in the same place as the firewall usually sits. There's hardware in the center that can physically send information in only one direction. Um, it's not physically possible to send anything back. How does that work? There's a circuit board on the left with a fiber optic transmitter in it, a laser. There's a circuit board on the right with a receiver and a short piece of bright orange fiber that connects those two circuit boards. You can send from the industrial network out to the world, but you cannot send anything back in. It's not physically possible. There's no laser in the received circuit board. This is engineering grade unidirectionality. And the software, in a sense, is where the magic is because um, inevitably uh, you have data sources in the industrial side that you need to use on the IT side in order to gain business efficiencies. And again, remember, most engineering projects out there in the world are focused on improving efficiency. Because if you're producing a commodity, you have razor thin profit margins. If you can save 3% on the cost of operating a large facility, that might be your entire profit margin for the whole year. This is the world we live in. So um, data sources, you know, imagine for the sake of argument, an Oracle database is the focus of sending information out to the world from the industrial network. All the data you want to share with the businesses in Oracle, the software logs into the Oracle database, asks Oracle for everything that's new in the last second since we logged in last, takes that snapshot of data, pushes it through the strange one-way hardware, and on the outside, populates an enterprise Oracle. Any thing on the enterprise network, a person, a program needs the data, can ask the data, can ask the enterprise Oracle for the data and get the same answer as the live system would have given without ever sending anything into the industrial network. So this is the the, the secret sauce. One way hardware with, with uh, software makes copies of the service. Not the only kind of network engineering, but currently the most widely deployed kind out there. I mentioned nuclear generators. All of North America's nuclear generators are protected this way. Uh, some of them buy our stuff, some of them buy competitors, but they're all protected this way. No nation state network attack can penetrate into a network whose only connection to the outside world is engineering grade unidirectional. So this is the good news for heavily defended industry in, in North America. And I think I'm going to skip the rest of this. Um, again, it's uh, covered in the book. The book is written um, 
at a high level. The subtitle is a manager guide. So I recommend it to those of you, even if you know you aren't terribly technical. For the first three quarters of the book, I fly high and slow. Okay, high level overview. Again, in Appendix B, I reproduce material from the, the previous book, which was much more technical, 20 unidirectional network design patterns, many of which are unexpected. How can you do remote support through a unidirectional gateway? Well, you can. How can you do um, you know, intensely bidirectional web protocols through the gateway? Well, you can. It's surprising. This is why I wrote the book. There's 20 surprising network designs in chapter, sorry, in, in Appendix B for you. Um, and uh, they're rather more technical. So uh, those of you who, who uh, got tired of the, the flying high and slow in Appendix B, I dropped low and fast. Um, an example I'm not going to go through. And this is basically it. So thus far, because I have you in theory for another 40, 45 minutes. And um, I was going to start asking you questions um, about cyber attacks and breaking into industrial systems, because I maintain that um, it's impossible to defend to design effective defenses without at least some understanding of who's coming after us and what tools are using and how capable those tools are. So that's what I'm going to I'm going to switch gears. But before I switch gears, uh, questions, argument on this material so far? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, Mr. Andrew. Uh, so my question is, uh, like, based on what what aspects the mitigation or prevention strategies are framed? Uh, let's talk about your um, unidirectional gateway that you mentioned on the control systems that are being used in uh, wide applications. Um, let's say if a particular attack has not occurred before, uh, how those mitigation strategies are framed uh, in a general aspect, not um, specific to waterfall security uh, from your experience? Sure. Um, so an attack that has never been seen for. Um, again, if the attack is stealing information, that's not what I study. Um, I'm the wrong person to ask. I have opinions on everything, but they're no more, no, no more, no more valuable than your own opinions. Um, let's talk about sab cyber sabotage. Um, in my understanding, there's really only two ways that you can sabotage physical operations. Um, it's all about attack information. The only way to sabotage operations is for attack information to enter the system. There's only two ways that information can move. There's online movement through wires, through fiber, through wireless, where photons, possibly electrons move, but there's no physical movement. There's no macro, macro physical movement that, that you can detect. And through offline mechanisms where we carry objects that carry a lot of information in them into a target and bring on those, 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 those media, uh, the attack information into the target. Um, and so when we talk about zero days, we talk about, you know, novel attacks. When we're talking about a network attack, if it's online, um, it doesn't matter how clever the attack is. All cyber sabotage is information. If the information can't get in, the attack can't get in. It's that simple. It's over. When we're talking offline, that was the Stuxnet scenario on USBs. That is, you know, these devices, I'm sorry, are walking wireless attack vectors. Um, when we're talking offline, that's chapter eight. And basically, uh, network engineering doesn't save you. Network engineering is about online attacks. Um, we need intense control over every way that information can enter the system on a cell phone, on a USB, in my head. These are insider attacks, a, you know, a password with malicious intent. The good news is that, you know, new attack vectors are invented, almost not at all. What we see is more and more sophisticated software coming in through those existing vectors. And so if we can control those attack vectors by, you know, uh, class, again, textbook example, um, you've got DVD drives on your, uh, your computers uh, in the industrial network, but you don't need them. You only use them during soft upgrades which happen you know, once every three years. And when you do that, you replace the computer. You don't just upgrade the software. Um, 
remove the drives, put them in storage. If they don't need to be there, get rid of them. That attack vector is gone now. One of your 24 is just off the table. So it doesn't matter how sophisticated the compromise of the, the ISO file system on the, on the DVD is. There's no DVD player anymore. So um, the short answer is there is no easy answer. Uh, the long answer is, you know, people the, that I work with, they, the owners and operators, they take deep, intense measures to control those physical attack vectors, most of which are focused on insiders because it's the insiders who are physically carrying these media. Um, one thing that I see people starting to use is what's called a uh, um, a near miss, a, a cyber near miss program. In the safety world, if I'm in a in a, a car factory and I walk under a three ton vehicle, and uh, you know I got my hard hat on. And the vehicle, you know, the chain breaks and the vehicle crashes to the ground behind me. Several of us are going to go and fill out a safety miss. Because if circumstances had been just a little different, if I'd stopped and picked up a pen, I'd be dead. A safety near miss. What I see owners and operators in, in the, the most secure industries doing is implementing cyber near miss protocols. Where they instrument all of the ways that information can move into their system and every one of those alarms produces a say you know a cyber near miss report and we analyze them on the end of the month just like we do safety near miss reports and ask what lessons can we learn from this and we discover on the end of the month that 37 percent of last month's cyber near misses were andrew with his ulb key somebody give that man remedial training this is a program that that, that, that we're seeing that that is helping um, reduce the possibility of anything coming in, no matter how sophisticated, because we control the movement of information. That's a long answer to short question, sorry. Okay, so let me turn this around. Um, I'm gonna ask for audience participation. We need to understand who's coming after us and, and uh, how that's happening. Um, we need to understand the built-in limitations, the fundamental limitations of the cybersecurity technologies that we're using, or you know we can't we can't deploy them effectively. I, I had uh, one of my people I don't know, eight years ago sent to CISSP training. For those of you you know young in the audience, that's a, a very well-known uh, cybersecurity certification program. He went training. He took the test. Uh, I, he came back and I said, uh, great, you know, what did you learn? We learned everything. We learned about intrusion detection and risk management and, you know, identity management, everything. I said, great, here's a power plant. I sketched the network. I said, uh, how would you protect this network from cyber attacks? And his answer was, um, I don't know, I'd put one of each in there. Put some intrusion detection, some intrusion prevention, and some firewalls, and some everything. And I said, great. And I showed him an attack. Bang, 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 I'm in. And he goes, oh, I didn't think about that. It's not enough to put one of everything. It doesn't work. You need an understanding of how the bad guys are coming after us. And an understanding of what are the intrinsic limitations of the one of everything. So let me ask you, Pop. Um, Antivirus. We all have antivirus on our computers. Um, what is the old way? What was the first way back in the day that malware defeated antivirus? Anyone? Yes, sir. Email. Email. So, yes, thank you. Email is how the virus got onto the machine, but antivirus is supposed to say, when you click on it, it's supposed to say, hey, you know, this is a virus. Um, you know, kick it out. Or when it scans the machine, it's supposed to say, hey, that matches a signature, it's a virus, quarantine it. How do you defeat that function? Now, you may not be, it, it, this is not how they do it today. Maybe it's a not a fair question for a younger audience. The first malware out there um, would turn off the antivirus. It's that simple. It would stop the scanner. That's really hard to do today. The antivirus vendors have made that really hard. So that's the old way to defeat antivirus. What is what is the, the hard way to defeat antivirus? Yeah. Is that you got an answer for me? 
a a dip file zip file a zip file yes um might be password protected uh antivirus can't look inside if it doesn't know the password um not what i was thinking but it, that's legit that will get the, the the malware onto the system uh you know antivirus still yet you still got to launch the malware somehow but good point the, there's not one answer to a lot of these i have an answer in mind but you know i did a a, a thing uh 10 years ago 13 ways to break a firewall and uh recently updated with a different 13 ways here's the bad news all of the original 13 ways still worked so it's not it's not like there's only one answer here so good answer zip files defeated encryption tends to defeat um intrusion detection of any sort and intrusion detection is part of antivirus what i was thinking of was find a vulnerability in the antivirus server um, this is the hard way to do it because vulnerabilities are a hard to find and b you got to write code as a rule to exploit them. But fundamentally, all software has bugs. I wrote software for 20 years for very demanding employers, very high quality standards. And yet, in spite of those very high quality standards, every piece of software I produced, every piece of software all of my colleagues and I produced um, had bugs in it. And some of those bugs were security holes. This is the nature of the beast. Um, and so in practice, all software can be hacked. You know, the question is, you know, there's two kinds of, of vulnerabilities. There's there's the kind, three kinds maybe. There's the kind we know about and we're madly trying to fix. There's the kind our enemies know about and are exploiting without our knowledge. And there's the kind neither of us have figured out yet, but they're sitting there waiting to be discovered. So that's the hard way. What's the most common way of breaking antivirus, of, of running malware on a machine in such a way that antivirus cannot tell. And this surprises a lot of people. How do, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking primarily signature-based antivirus. Anomaly bases, we have to break a different way. How do antivirus vendors produce signatures for their product? Yes, sir. Stolen certificates. That thought. I'm going to ask uh, my next question. Uh, that, that's the right answer to the next question. Um, but no. The way that antivirus vendors put signatures is they've got a million or two honeypots on the on the internet, every one of these vendors. And these honeypots are pretending to be poorly defended endpoints. They're pretending to be people. They got anim, you know, they they got technology that pretends, you know, clicks on stuff, brings up every P of email they ever get, says, yes, run everything. And when they discover an artifact in the file system or in memory or going out to the network, they're going. This machine is not supposed to be reaching out to that machine. Clearly, something is wrong here. Takes a snapshot of it, throws it in a database, restores the, the virtual machine, and repeats. And does some preliminary machine analysis of what's in the database. When it finds five or 10,000 of the same artifact in the database, it says, you know, I think we got a live one here. And it does a preliminary analysis, makes some recommendations as to a signature, involves a human security analyst, reviews the whole thing, fine-tunes the signature, and bang, it goes up three hours later as a new antivirus signature. And so the modern way to defeat antivirus is don't get greedy. Write your malware. Infect a power plant or six. Do not let it loose on the internet. Do not try and harvest a million uh, machines for a botnet and there may never be a signature for your malware this is the modern attack pattern for targeted ransomware they write stuff that antivirus has never seen they get you to click on it and now they're in and if they're clever they erase that artifact so that they can use it again they don't leave it behind for the the investigative team to find um, the malware phones home to a command and control center and says, hey, boss, I got a live one. What do you want? And a human attacker sends commands into the malware. It's called a remote access trojan, a rat. Sends, sends commands into the rat and um, operates the rat by remote control. Says, uh, look around the network. Do an ARP ping. Tell me what you got. Command response. These tools are menu driven. These tools, they've got features that like remote desktop. You can wait till the dead of night in target's time zone and 
bring up the screen and move the mouse. Okay, you can control the computer. Um, so this is the modern attack pattern. It used to be called advanced persistent threats. I don't like the term. How many people in the world, how many, how many people in the room here? I'm curious, honest answer. How many people in the room here believe that you personally, your laptop will ever be the target of an advanced attack? Some people at the back, most of us go advanced. That's like nation state, isn't it? I'm not important enough to be a nation state target. No advanced attack is ever going to come after me. The word advanced is one of the worst pieces of marketing that ever came out of the, the Department of Homeland Security when they coined the phrase back in 2007. Back then, it meant Chinese intelligence agencies, but they didn't want to use that phrase, so they invented another one, advanced persistent threat. Everyone said, oh, advanced. I don't need to worry then. Yes, you do, because this is what ransomware is using today. They're using the tools of nation states back in 2007, these advanced persistent threats. That's the model. That's the, the technology that everybody uses. So certificates. What is the, now I got to find the right adjective. Um, what is the best known way to defeat encryption? Steal a certificate, steal a private key. Okay. Encryption is all about, uh, you know, taking stuff you can read, turning it into stuff nobody can read, using a key, and then using that key or an, an analogous key, public, private, whatever, to decrypt again on, you know, in, in, in the destination. Um, if you steal the keys, all bets are off. Why was Spectre and Meltdown so important? It's because they it were a way to steal keys. So, but um, so that's, that's encryption. Uh, what's the hard way? to defeat encryption. So yeah. brute force, brute force. Okay, well, actually that's harder than what I was thinking. <laughs> Supercomputer on it for the next million years. Yes, that is the hard way to break encryption. Find the key that way. Good point, good point. I was thinking of the same way, the hard way to defeat antivirus, which is uh, find a vulnerability, find a zero day, code to exploit it. And, you know, I'm going to ask you this question over again. The answer is the hard way is to find a vulnerability. But people do this. They find vulnerabilities in crypto systems. Um, and for that matter, what's the mathematical way to do the hard thing? Instead of a million years on a supercomputer, instead you steal it. Instead, you hire a hundred math PhDs and you break the algorithm. You find a vulnerability in the mathematics that says, I don't need a million years. All I need is a week and a half. This is what happened to Blowfish. This is why nobody uses Blowfish anymore. Um, what is the modern way to defeat encryption? Here's a hint. The connections between the rat and the command and control center, the C2 out in the internet, hackersarrest.com, connect, that connection is encrypted. What's inside that encrypted connection? The attack information. The modern way to defeat encryption is to compromise the endpoint. If you, so think about it. Um, how many of us have ever received what's obviously a piece of malware in an attachment in email? Hopefully, none of us clicked on it, but how many of us have ever received something that's obviously, you know, it's happened. It happened. So when that happened to you, where'd that email come from? It came from the email server. It came from Outlook, came from, you know, the, the, the Unix email server. The connection between your laptop or your desktop and that email server encrypted, wasn't it? That attack came inside an encrypted connection from the email server into your laptop. If you'd clicked on it, you'd be in trouble. This is the modern way to defeat encryption. Ignore it. Compromise the endpoint. Use the encryption facilities that exist legitimately between the compromised endpoint and your target and attack the system inside the encrypted connection. Yes, ma'am. Text messages. 
Um, so the, the question is, what about over text messages? Um, I'm not an expert on that. Um, I don't even know if it's possible to encode an attack in the text message. So, so most of your malware. So that is because the texting system nowadays can actually send images and, and attachments. I mean, in the old days, all it could do was send, what was it, 160 characters? That was it. And, you know, I defy you to fit where into 160 characters. But nowadays, you can basically send attachments through and there's a technology. And so, yes, um, I don't know about text messages in, in version one or two of the, uh, the the wireless protocol you saw there, these things not encrypted. Today, I would hope they're encrypted, but I'm not the person to ask. Um, what I will say is that uh, most modern communications today, WhatsApp, is encrypted end to end and happily sends infected attachments through that encrypted connection into a target. But good question. Okay. Um, Encryption. What else? Um, identity and access management. Fancy word for usernames and passwords and permissions. Um, what is the obvious way? What's the easy way, the low-tech way to break an identity and access management system? You heard it mentioned today. The low-tech way is shoulder surf. Look over the shoulder. Oh, that's the password. Make a note. Go back and use it. Um, this is why everyone nowadays says use two-factor authentication. So we're going to break two-factor authentication in a, in a minute. But um, let's stick with, with identity and access management. Yes, sir. Yes. So sometimes two-factor is not enough. We need multi-factor. Set that aside. We're going to break multi-factor in just a minute. Um, identity and access management. Um, let me put out there sort of a, a principle, a design principle for our networks. Um, a lot of us, you know, what is the dominant identity and access management system out there? In the corporate world, it's Windows Active Directory. In the academic world, it might be something Linux-ish. I'm not sure. Um, but the... Uh, you know, the, the, a lot of people imagine that their identity and access management system is, you know, an integral part of their security system. They see it as a security tool. And that's arguably the wrong way to look at it. What these systems are, these are systems that manage identity and permissions, management tools, not security tools. These are management tools that urgently need to be secured because if you compromise that management tool, all bets are off. Modern attack pattern is remote control into the remote access Trojan. What do we look around for? We look around to find the Active Directory controller. We look around to find, you know, if you're lucky, you stumble across lists of passwords in plain text on the machine you've compromised. Um, but if you don't, I mean, the, the, the holy grail of, of uh, so let me ask the experienced people. I've been, I've been asking the, uh, the students, the, the knowledgeable in the room. You know the answer. Um, if the bad guys get into a network, um, think Active Directory. What is their target? What do they want to do to on with the Active Directory server? I may be phrasing the question wrong, but you know the answer. They want to get domain. They want a user on that system that has universal per permission to do anything they want, to anything they want. That's what they want. How do they get that? Well, you know, if you're lucky, if you're very lucky, they, they haven't patched the, the domain controller and you can exploit a known vulnerability if you're not lucky it's right up to date and there's layers of protection and uh, so how do we do it well there's a tool i forget the name of it mini cats that lets you scrape credentials out of memory on the local machine and so a common attack pattern is to uh cause 
the machine, we've got a foothold in the industrial, in the, uh, the enterprise network, cause the machine to malfunction in some way, you know, turn off the sound, something. And um, what does the, the owner of the machine comes in the next day and says, my sound doesn't work and can't figure out how to fix it because we've, we've jimmied in, I don't know, the, the registry or something. Yes, we can. Done. Sorry. Um, brain blank. Oh, right. We're compromising Active Directory. Um, and so what do they do? They call IT. IT logs, you know, calls up and says, have you, did you do anything? I didn't do nothing. I swear I never touched it. Eventually, IT remotes into the machine with administrator credentials, often domain administrator credentials, finds the problem in the registry. He says, you must have done something because this doesn't change by itself. Pointing fingers, there's a, an acronious conversation. They hang up on each other. Everybody logs out and the credentials are still sitting there in memory in the cache. You scrape the credentials and now you've got admin. What do you do with that? You create your own admin account. Okay, you don't use admin because people are going to get suspicious sooner or later. Create your account called backup-admin-2. And will, is anybody going to be surprised if they see the account backup-admin-2 logging into every machine on the network? Well, no, that's what backup administrators do. They log in to make sure that the backups are set up correctly. And what you're doing is stealing information and, and whatnot because you've taken over the identity and access management system. Um, I promise to shut up. Um, I hope this has been useful. Some of this information is in Appendix A, saying the title of the appendix is how to hack everything. I hope you find it useful. When I write these books, I don't generally invent the stuff. As I said, I document what I learned. Feedback is important. Feedback on my first book ranged from, Andrew, I disagree so fundamentally with your premise, I could not finish reading the thing. All the way to, Andrew, what you've written is so obviously true, I'm not sure why you bothered writing it down taught me you know a couple of things one of them is experts disagree but it taught me the value of feedback so, um, i would be grateful if you know grab a business card uh connect with me on linkedin and let me know if you whoever you are in whatever role you have found the material useful or not i'll take good i'll take bad i'll take ugly send me your feedback thank you any final questions for andrew Okay, if not, we'll wrap up the session and